All right, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to another Open Science presentation stream. I'm Dr. Ben Meekins, uh, Research Assistant Professor at the University of South Carolina. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming in tonight. We have a, another great presentation schedule. Um, I, I always like to do a, a quick little introduction to the stream since it's still fairly new. Uh, we usually have you know one or two uh, new people in the in the chat or viewers anyway. Um, so the the whole goal behind doing this is to uh, basically set up a space for, for researchers at all different levels of science to uh, present their work. And it can be anybody from, you know, in theory, uh, like a high schooler or undergraduate to a fully tenured professor. Um, and that's been reflected so far in the people that have presented. We've had graduate students, postdocs, uh, assistant professors, and an associate professor. Um, people from all different backgrounds, um, and that's kind of what we're going for here. Um, you know, this is not, this is, it's sort of like a conference, but um, not quite as seriously. Oh, my audio skipping a little bit. Is it still doing it, Freddie? All right, I'll keep going for right now. Uh-oh. Hang on one second, everybody. Okay, um, I'll keep going for right now, and we'll see if it maybe it's a, a bandwidth issue that'll clear up. Um, so basically, like I said, you know, this this whole project is to uh, provide a space for researchers to pre to present their work um, with without it being um, as serious as a conference. Um, so it can be used as a space for practice. Uh, for instance, if you if you are practicing for a, a PhD candidacy exam or defense, or if you're getting ready for a conference, anything like that, um, and it's also just a space to show off your work. Um, you know, conferences are very expensive nowadays, even with the virtual virtual ones, um, and so it's it's something that uh, you know I feel like it's this is a useful place um, for people to to be able to present their work without having to pay hundreds of dollars to do so. Um, if you are new, if you're interested in presenting your work here, um, please feel free to get in touch with me. You can send me a DM here on Twitch. Uh, you can shoot me an email at meekins at sc.edu. That's M-E-E-K-I-N-S at sc.edu. Um, you can also find me on Twitter uh, at meekinslab, M-E-E-K-I-N-S-L-A-B, all, all mashed together. Um, we also have a, a YouTube channel that these talks are uploaded to. After the fact, um, I edit them down. Um, to just the talk in the Q&A, uh, and then they're uploaded for the, the presenters to use as they see fit. And um, uh, we also have a Discord, um, and the links for all of that are below the stream. Um, and once the talk is started, I'll, go, I'll drop the links in, into the chat as well uh, for anybody that's interested. Um, I think that about covers it. Uh, you know, we, we have lots of open dates. Uh, in, in the near and far future, um, and I don't mind scheduling out. Uh, we actually, actually have somebody scheduled for February of 2021. Um, so, you know, if, if the near future is not good for you, but you, you want to go ahead and schedule a date later on, that works fine. Um, and so I think that's everything that I'd like to say. And uh, with that, um, I will introduce our speaker tonight, who is Dr. Jonathan Holland. Uh, he's a postdoc from Wayne State University. Um, and he is going to talk to us tonight about synthesis, synthesis and characterization of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, and I can tell from the title alone that, that I am already well out of my depth uh, as a chemical engineer. So I look forward to seeing this talk. Uh, I think it would be very interesting. Um, and Jonathan had also said that uh, he was going to include a little bit about atomic layer deposition techniques. Um, and so the, this should be a nice uh, a little kind of a two-parter uh, talk. And with that, uh, I will stop talking here and Jonathan can take over. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Ben said, I, I'll be presenting um, mostly my work uh, during grad school on synthesis and characterization of um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And the main sort of motivation for this is to use these materials um, as the semiconducting material in uh, field effect transistors. Um, so here I just have like, a nice picture that I think is really cool. It was the first um, sort of drawing in a patent of a field effect transistor 
several decades before there was ever a, a practical use. I just think it looks really cool. Um, but there's a there's several reasons why um, you know we would want to use uh, organic materials in um, electronic devices. Um, the main ones I, I have kind of right here, um, such as low energy, large area uh, fabrication. Um, the devices can be flexible and transparent. Um, you know, the um, energy levels or properties of the material can be uh, tuned through functionalization, which is in theory uh, relatively simple, in, in practice, maybe not so much. Um, and the mobilities of uh, organic materials have surpassed that of amorphous silicon. And so it's uh, largely replaced uh, many of the applications that um, amorphous silicon once, um, once had. Um, there are several notable drawbacks to uh, organic materials in electronic devices. Um, one of the largest problems is uh, the instability of the organic layers uh, to aerobic conditions um, or just in general uh, instability during device operation. Um, also, there's a lack of high mobility n type materials. Um, there are many examples of n type organic materials, but um, most of them have relatively low mobility um, and they're you know, quite a bit more rare than the p type counterparts. Um, there's also issues with energetic mismatch at the electrode organic interface. Um, and then you, know, you can design a molecule, you know, everything could look good, and then when you try to deposit it, um, the solid state packing could just be not conducive to charge transfer. Um, so that's an, another big drawback um, in trying to say, plan out a, a material. Um, and so just for a very, very basic scheme for how these work, um, you know, uh, field effect transistors are a three terminal device. Uh, so you have source and drain terminals and the gate. And so a, a large enough gate bias um, from the source or between the source and the gate um, at a high enough voltage, um, either holes or electrons can travel to the drain, depending on the type of uh, semiconductor you have. Um, um, uh, hole carriers, majority hole carriers are P-type, while uh, majority electron carriers are N-type. Um, and so the reason that um, P-type materials are so common for uh, in, in organic field effect transistors is that they're uh, usually large aromatic um, uh, molecules that are highly electron rich. Um, so it's much easier to say, remove it, an electron leaving that behind a hole um, from these molecules than it is to add an electron to an already electron rich system. Um, and so just to give a you know, vague idea of where they kind of lie on the scale, um, crystalline silicon can have you know, extremely high charge carrier mobility above a thousand. Um, so uh, organics are very, very unlikely to ever sort of achieve that. Um, but as I said uh, earlier, they have largely replaced um, many applications that amorphous silicon was initially slated to um, be used for. Um, and that's because uh, initially organic semiconductors had um, abilities you know, that were very, very low, about 10 to the minus five. Um, and now, at least the last time I checked, which was during grad school, <laughs> Uh, the mobility sort of record is for an organic semiconductor is uh, 45 uh, square centimeters per volt second. And so I kind of have a, you know, general, very dumbed down scheme of like where those um, units come from. Um, and just to give an idea of sort of the history of organic uh, materials and their mobility, uh, the first OFET device that was reported was uh, use these oligothiophenes. Um, and that was like actually the lowest mobility ever reported. Um, it was 10 to the minus five, and this was back in 1987. Um, but this led to you know, a series of sort of, of research on, on these molecules now that it was show, shown that they could actually you know, be operated in a device. Um, in 1993, uh, sort of this was sort of the best mobility for these polythiophenes, uh, which is this dihexyl sexothiophene, which is 0.22 uh, square minute square centimeters per volt second. And you know, I'm not gonna go through all of these as I did in my defense, um, but some of the highlights are uh, C60 being shown to have uh, N-channel mobility of 0.3 um, square centimeters per volt second. Uh, I believe this was the first example of an organic material um, having N-type mobility. Um, 
pentacene was actually the first organic material that had uh, mobility higher than amorphous silicon. Um, however, it suffered, uh, suffers from um, significant degradation during device operation. And then one other, or a couple other ones I wanna highlight are this, um, these uh, paraline diamides. Uh, they have you know, reliably much higher end channel mobility. Um, and they're also quite stable during device operation. Uh, and then this molecule here, this uh, dioctyl benzothionobenzothiophene, um, or C8-BTBT uh, for short. Um, uh, while this was synthesized first, or I guess first reported in, in an OFET in 2007 uh, with a mobility of 1.8, uh, this is actually the molecule that holds the current record um, for organic uh, uh, mobility at, at around 45. Uh, and so all of this has actually come about because of uh, increases to um, uh, processing of m many of these molecules, not necessarily, say, synthesis of something you know, completely new, uh, which I just find kind of interesting. Um, and so with that, I'd like to move into some of my uh, synthetic work, which was initially uh, working on these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons of the uh, circulene family. Um, so contorted aromatics, um, you know, have been shown to have very interesting optoelectronic properties. Um, obviously, I already brought this up, but uh, the most famous of these is C60 or Buckminster fullerene. Um, but other molecules or fullerene fragments um, are known to have very similar properties, though they aren't, they typically aren't quite as good, say, as um, C60, but generally they're uh, more functionalizable, um, more soluble, and maybe easier to obtain. Um, so a lot of these, especially hexabenzochoranines and coranuline, are quite popular uh, in the PAH field. Um, and it's really this curved structure that gives them sort of these unique properties relative to planar aromatic compounds. Um, so as I said, our group focused on this family of molecules called circulines. And what these are, um, basically, they're a series of molecules with an N-membered uh, central ring surrounded by uh, radially fused uh, benzene rings. And so the number is just, it comes from the number of the, um, of the central ring. Um, and they're interesting because uh, this central ring also dictates sort of the shape they, they take on. So when N is less than six, um, these are actually bowl shaped. So uh, four and five circulene are bowl shaped. Um, when N is, is equal to six, uh, it's planar. Um, and then when N is greater than six, they're saddle shaped. And then theoretically at much larger sizes. So it's like say N is greater than or equal to 16. Um, they are theorized to be helical though. Um, no molecules, uh, no circulines that large have been synthesized to date. Um, and I just want to point out that seven circulin is the largest successfully synthesized unsubstituted derivative uh, to date. So the first report of um, attempting to synthesize eight circulin uh, was reported way back in 1976. Um, and uh, they used this um, light induced cyclization uh, reaction um, to attempt to close these final four rings. Um, but what they found was they were only able to produce this partially closed um, um, molecule shown here. And later calculations actually shed some light on this. Um, and the takeaway from that study was actually that the unsubstituted eight circulating molecule itself is inherently unstable. Um, and so to understand this, uh, we have to use a you know, relatively unknown um, theory of aromaticity, which is Klar's model of aromaticity in polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, so there's a, quite a bit more to it, but the uh, basic rule of, uh, or I guess Klar's rule basically states that the resonance structure with the most aromatic sextets is the most important for the characterization of PAHs. So if we go back to the general um, eight circulating structure, uh, you can kind of make out, you can incorporate four of these um, rings into aromatic sextets. Um, however, that leaves these four sort of um, isolated double bonds. And these isolated double bonds are actually the source of the instability in these uh, molecules. And so uh, looking at this, what our group um, sort of basically decided was the easiest way to sort of solve this problem is to simply incorporate them 
into their own aromatic sex sextets uh, with addition of, addition of uh, benzo substituents on the periphery of the molecule. And so um, some of the earlier, uh, or some of the work in, in the group before I joined, um, uh, so by one of the older graduate students, Dr. Robert Miller, um, was working on this tetrabenzo-8 circulene. And so the plan was to take this dibenzo cyclooctadiene, um, subject it to a Diels-Alder cycloaddition um, to get this, uh, this adduct intermediate here, which could then undergo palladium catalyzed aerylation to close these final four bonds um, to get to uh, tetrabenzo-8 circulene. And um, uh, this palladium catalyzed aerylation sort of reaction was already quite well known to generate um, several highly strained systems. Um, and so his initial work was using, uh, you know, a couple of sort of highly reactive dienes, such as um, these furans or these uh, uh, thiophene dioxides. Unfortunately, at these high uh, reaction temperatures, uh, what he was really only seeing was decomposition of the alkyne. Um, but fortunately, in the process of synthesizing these thiophene dioxides, he found um, that the thiophene monoxide is an isoluble uh, intermediate. So during the reaction, you can take a TLC of, of you know, the reaction mixture, and as soon as you start seeing uh, this thiophene dioxide, you stop the reaction, you can collect um, thiophene monoxide, 26% yield, with uh, almost the entire rest of the mass being collected as the starting material, which you can just you know, uh, go through this cycle again um, to collect more. Um, and so he took this thiophene oxide and uh, reacted it with um, dibenzocycloactadiene and successfully um, synthesized compound eight here in 14% yield, um, subjected this to the palladium catalyzed aerylation conditions um, with microwave heating at 180 degrees C uh, to get tetrabenzoate circulating. Um, and he actually employed this uh, strategy um, to also have sort of a library of of functionalized um, derivatives. Um, so you can check that out um, later if you feel interested in this. Um, but the main plan then was to, in my case, was to synthesize the 12 member derivative, uh, which is the hexabenzo 12 circulene, um, using a you know, pretty much identical synthetic strategy, starting with compound 10 here, um, known as 12 annuline, running the deals all the reaction and then the palladium. Uh, catalyzed uh, aerylation. Um, so, you know, I went about doing this. This was like my first project in grad school, um, making this 12 annually. Um, unfortunately, uh, what I found was, uh, you know, using either of our two uh, highly reactive dienes in toluene or 1,2-dichlorobenzene up to 210 degrees C using conventional microwave heating uh, did not lead to formation of any of the desired product. Um, pretty much I would get a quantitative yield of the starting material and decomposition products of the, of the, um, the dienes. And so, uh, I mean, it, this wasn't necessarily uh, surprising. Um, this molecule, you know, all of these alkynes are planar and linear, so they're much more stable than, uh, you know, the previous uh, diene. Um, so what we initially thought was maybe we can activate these alkynes um, electronically with via functionalization. Um, and at this point, uh, we weren't entirely sure if it was a normal demand deals alder. We thought it was an inverse demand, um, but it's relatively simple to functionalize, uh, you know, or it seemed relatively simple to functionalize the 12 annually to really try both strategies of, um, you know, modifying our, our energetics of the reaction. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the ways of doing this is to install electron donating groups, uh, which is you know, pretty straightforward, just taking uh, veritrol, iodinating it, um, and going through a uh, similar uh, Diels Alder slash deprotect sequence, um, which you're going to see a lot of in this presentation, so um, should become very familiar to everyone. Um, one interesting thing to note is um, instead of using the typical TMS acetylene, uh, I found it was impossible to separate the um, the monocoupled, the dicoupled, and the starting material uh, by column chromatography. Uh, so I had to synthesize this polar protecting group, which just has a cyano group out here, um, and which helped me uh, isolate uh, the monocoupled product in 30% yield. Um, 
One interesting thing to note is that um, this TBAF deprotect reaction is typically quantitative. Um, it's, you know, it's usually a very nice, fun reaction to run because it's you know really easy to purify and you get quantitative yield. Um, but I was seeing 75% yield, which I found kind of strange. Um, but nonetheless, I took this forward through the next step uh, using Sonogashira or Nagishi coupling conditions, um, but was unable to really isolate anything that you know was seemed to be a coupled product. You know, the desired material, none of the other oligomers, none of the starting material. Um, and what I found in the course of sort of running these reactions, even though this is a, a reported molecule using this you know synthetic strategy. Um, or I guess a similar synthetic strategy, I could not find any other uh, literature precedent of using this specific terminal alkyne in, in any other synthesis uh, scheme or any um, references to this, um, you know, this actual synthetic scheme, uh, you know, no ref nobody refer uh, referencing this one. Um, so what I found was that this molecule, even when kept cold, even, uh, just decomposes extremely quickly. So even storing this in the in the freezer, we had a minus twenty degree freezer. Um, even overnight, by the time I would get there in the morning, even if I wrapped it in aluminum foil under argon, um, it would just be a black solid, sort of completely decomposed. Um, so I think that this is just sort of too unstable to really even survive long enough to form the desired product. Um, so simultaneously, though. Um, we use you know, similar synthetic pathway um, to functionalize this molecule with nitro groups. And you'll notice here, uh, which I'll get to in a second, that there's no reported um, yield. But what I found after this reaction um, was I collected a you know, very nice, bright orange material. Um, it was very easy to synthesize and purify. Uh, didn't seem to be any big issues. Um, I analyzed it by initially by uh, proton and carbon NMR. So you can see here. Um, you know, really exactly what we expect. Everything looks great. The carbon NMR looked great. Um, two alkyne and six aromatic single, uh, signals. Um, but when we had this analyzed by mass spec, uh, that's where things got a bit more confusing. Um, so the, you know, the MZ peak, which is really the only thing we saw from this molecule was 450. Uh, and as you can see, that doesn't really make sense for anything uh, in this reaction. It doesn't make sense for the you know, any other oligomers, um, nothing. And after a bit of thought and, and a little bit of literature searching, uh, what we found was I was actually synthesizing um, the homocoupled product. So this is the glasser coupling product in 56% yield. Uh, the mass matches perfectly for what we we're seeing. Um, and I was getting, you know, 0% of the Sonogashira product of this reaction. Um, so after sort of all of this um, sort of, uh, really no success in functionalizing this 12 annually. Um, this kind of got put on the, the back burner for a while while I worked on um, other projects. Uh, and then sort of near the end of my time in grad school, uh, some other members of the group um, making various uh, PAHs of their own, uh, were having some success using Barton Kellogg olefination um, to synthesize uh, you know, their molecules. Um, and so this was a well-known um, procedure for inducing or producing uh, strained uh, aromatics, um, such as the uh, functionalized hexabenzocoronines shown here. Um, so we basically adapted this synthetic strategy. So to get to this even more functionalized and strained uh, 12 circulating de derivative, we could do shoal coupling, uh, or I guess start at the beginning. We could take this uh, veritrolyl alcohol uh, have it undergo cyclotetramerization and oxidation to get this tetraketone, do barton kellogg olefination um, to install these four olefins, and then uh, finally uh, do Scholl coupling to close uh, the final eight bonds. Um, so obviously quite an ambitious uh, idea, um, but we thought it, it could be successful since these are you know, known to tolerate quite strange systems. Um, unfortunately, there is there was a literature precedent for this uh, tetraketone, um, starting from veritrolyl alcohol, you treat it with TFA in um, chloroform at zero degrees C um, by very slow dropwise addition. And uh, you get a majority of this cyclotetramer um, as well as the uh, trimer 
uh, uh, pentamer, hexamer, and, and larger ones. Um, but this is the primary product. Um, and in that procedure, the oxidation step uses um, 100 equivalents of potassium permanganate in refluxing pyridine, uh, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, so we explored a few metal catalyzed oxidations using tert butyl uh, yeah, hydroperoxide. Um, unfortunately, um, they failed to generate the uh, tetraketone and the ruthenium chloride reaction uh, ended up with just the, the diketone. Um, but nonetheless, uh, even though the yields were relatively low, I took what I had, uh, subjected it to Lawson's reagent followed by uh, diazodiphenyl uh, methane. Um, and unfortunately, I was, you know, by column and TLC, there were, you know, numerous, numerous spots uh, and, and fractions I collected. Unfortunately, none of them matched up to even a partially reacted um, product. It was very difficult to, to get anything definitive um, out of this. Uh, so this is sort of right up to the time when I was sort of leaving for my postdoc. Uh, so there's still a bunch of this kicking around the lab uh, that the plan is that once someone else sort of works out the optimized route using um, uh, Barton Kellogg olefination, maybe they'll just take some of what I left behind and just sort of see if they can they can get the desired product. Um, but with that, I'd like to switch to sort of the other major product um, during my time in grad school, which is synthesis of novel benzothieno benzothi benzothiophene derivatives or BTBT derivatives, as I'll refer to it from now on. <laughs> um, so the reason these are quite interesting, uh, as I mentioned at the sort of the intro was that um, they have you know, extremely high mobility for the uh, alkyl substituted derivatives. Um, and looking at the original sort of reported synthesis of this, uh, it seems like they should be pretty widely available. This uh, original procedure, even though it has some problematic steps where they don't have a procedure, um, has pretty good yields overall and relatively simple, um, you know, a relatively simple synthetic pathway. Um, unfortunately, uh, if you look these up from Sigma Aldrich, if you want a gram of this, it's approximately $2,800 um, without logging in, so it's probably a bit less. Uh, and the diphenyl derivative is about $1,600 per gram. Um, and so the reality is this synthesis doesn't really work um, for generating these, um, as I can say from experience. Um, and that's due to the sort of inherent reactivity of these um, BTBT, or the BTBT core. So when you have the core structure, um, the reactivity is generally limited to methylation at position one. So you can lithiate here, um, or electrophilic aromatic substitution at positions two, four, and seven. Um, so that's typically what's done for uh, synthesizing the alkyl derivatives, just Friedel Crafts isolation at uh, the two and seven positions to give you um, uh, two, seven dioctyl BTBT. Um, and even this 85% yield is quite generous. Um, you can collect that, but it's not pure enough. And I'm speaking from experience, it's not pure enough for use in um, devices. So typically it requires you know, multiple either sublimation or recrystallization steps um, afterwards uh, to get a product that's you know, pure enough for actual use in a device. Um, so that's what really drives up the cost of these and why they're presumably why they're not more widely used. Um, and so my early graduate work, so that was for the p-type semiconductor. Um, the easiest way to make something n-type is throw fluorines uh, anywhere you can at it. Um, so this is you know, kind of what I was initially attempting to, in my first year, um, starting from 4-iodoanilin, you, know, you can you know, uh, couple on a perfluorooctyl group, um, brominate it, do uh, Wolf-Kishner reduction, uh, Sonegashira coupling sequence uh, to get to the uh, alkyne here. Um, but what I quickly found you know, after this step was the solubility of you know perfluorooctyl um, planar aromatic things is just a nightmare. Um, so even though I was only able to collect a small amount of this, um, you know, we decided to just you know I had it. We might as well try the thiene, thiene annulation conditions. Um, but really, all this ended up making was the worst uh, sulfur-smelling orange sludge that was really annoying to clean. Um, that I couldn't really isolate anything useful out of. 
Um, uh, initial, and additionally, during this time, uh, because the diphenyl derivative is relatively difficult to th synthesize you know, via that initial um, reaction pathway, we thought we could sort of quickly come up with a path to get to the diphenyl derivative. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, again, um, sort of strangely, I was only able to ever isolate the monocoupled product here. Um, and even that, in that case, it was only in trace amounts. Um, and because this wasn't really you know, high priority, it was just an idea if we could do it quickly and easily, um, it wasn't really worth the time to sort of suss out the issues with, um, we kind of left this here as well. Um, so around that time, I was looking at, um, you know, how could we functionalize these BTBTs in a different way? And there's, there had been a growing interest in perylene diamides, um, specifically for use in polymers. Um, so I thought maybe we could incorporate these uh, diamide uh, functionality into BTBT. Uh, so the initial plan I had was to take this um, bromophthalic anhydride, iodinate it, treat it with a primary amine um, to get the imide, and then go through my Sonogashira coupling uh, sequence that I was very familiar with at this point, um, followed by thiene annulation to form the uh, thiophene core. Um, and we believe that these, you know, highly uh, electron withdrawing uh, imides would lower the LUMO sufficiently to give n-type character to BTBT. Um, so my initial synthetic strategy um, uh, began with iodination using uh, elemental iodine with um, fuming sulfuric acid at 85 degrees C, uh, followed by uh, treatment with thionyl chloride and a primary amine uh, in refluxing toluene. Unfortunately, what I found during this is sort of a wide range of yields, even though I, you know, as best as I could was keeping everything, you know, as consistent as possible. Um, and these use, yields were usually on this lower end at 15%. Uh, percent. Um, additionally, through the Senegashira coupling sequence, um, I was finding uh, a really low yield, less than 10% of the uh, desired uh, coupled alkyne or uh, cross-coupled alkyne. I was generally getting a, a lot of the glasser coupled or homocoupled alkyne product. Um, and, you know, after these steps and getting very low yield, it was very difficult to see, you know, the results of that, some of these initial uh, thiene annulation conditions. Um, so after a bit of work uh, through the literature, um, you know, this is the revised synthesis to get to this uh, cross-coupled alkyne. Um, so basically all, we, all I did was switch out the iodination conditions. Um, and if you control this uh, stoichiometry uh, in terms of you know, uh, iodate st uh, stoichiometry, because every iodine in here becomes an I plus in this reaction, um, you can selectively um, iodinate in one position and you get a mixture of the uh, anhydride here and the diacid. So I usually don't purify and I took it straight forward through the thionyl chloride and amine uh, treatment. And in, that, in this case, I got very consistent yields uh, with various uh, R groups um, and took that forward through the first Sonogashira, the D-Protect, and in this case, uh, used Nagishi coupling conditions to get a 60% yield of uh, the desired products. Uh, so with a reliable way to generate these materials, uh, you know, I was very hopeful that these uh, thionic annulation conditions would uh, go very well. Uh, unfortunately, I quickly found that I would almost entirely, or you know, almost always generate this monothiophene product. Um, and all conditions, I was really only able to isolate, you know, maybe a milligram or two, uh, enough to get a, a mass spec hit on this product. Um, and you know, I used various conditions, uh, different solvents, um, under pressure, microwave heating, um, anhydrous uh, sodium sulfide, the hydrated sodium sulfide, um, you know, stepwise addition. Uh, various equivalents, and in, in all cases, I, I would get you know 20 to 30 percent yield of this monothiophene product. Um, and so at this point, we were we we're having a few issues. One was solubility of both the starting material and these products, and also we thought uh, that it's some sort of you know electronic effect in you know having this strongly electron withdrawing group, maybe stopping the formation of the second thiophene. Um, but uh, I had a couple other, you know, 
uh, derivatives to attempt. So the cyclohexyl derivative, I was able to collect 10% of the uh, thiophene disulfide. Um, so initially, I was very excited to have you know something that was soluble and I could actually run a column on. Um, but upon uh, examination by NMR and mass spec, uh, basically it, we found that it had this extra sulfur group or, or sulfur here. Um, and there are ways to um, convert this to the thiophene um, using uh, basically uh, mixing it with copper mesh and just you know heating the crap out of it. Uh, unfortunately, in those attempts, uh, I, I was only able to ever collect the starting material back quantitatively. Um, and then we had an idea that if we lower the uh, molecular weight of, of uh, you know, the product, uh, maybe we could sublime it instead. Uh, and I was able to sublime uh, material out of this, but it was you know, a complex mixture of um, really nothing that looked like even the starting material or the desired product. Um, so with these results, um, we looked at a way of, sort of overcoming the solubility issues as well as the electronic issues and switched to these um, push-pull derivatives. Um, so in this case, instead of having the, you know, synthesizing the diimide, uh, we would have an imide with these uh, alkoxy groups on the other end. Uh, so add an additional um, chain for solubility and also change the electronics of the system. Um, so this synthesis, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty good yields um, up to the alkyne. Um, and I used the uh, dying emulation conditions under pressure. So this is with acetonitrile and sealed tube. And uh, I was able to collect uh, in 10% yield the C8 derivatives and the C12 derivatives of this um, compound 60. Um, so it was nice, even though this uh, yield was quite low, it was nice to actually finally, after you know, lots of struggle to, to get a, you know, a useful, or I guess a, a material out of this finally. Um, so I characterized this by um, proton NMR. Uh, interestingly, uh, even though we added this additional alkyl chain, um, they were still, these compounds were still uh, very insoluble. So in order to collect this NMR, um, basically I would have to take a Erlenmeyer flask of 50 degree C uh, water with my NMR tube in it to the NMR room and immediately uh, you know, take a proton NMR before it could crash out of solution. Um, and so for that reason, I couldn't collect uh, uh, carbon-13 NMR on this, um, but the proton NMR looks really nice. Um, I was able to analyze it by UV Viz as well. And um, in the red trace here, this is the compound 60A. Uh, the black trace is uh, C8BTBT. And uh, basically what we see from this is what you know, we expect. The lowest energy transi transition um, is uh, at a higher wavelength, uh, which indicates narrowing of the homo lumo gap, which is expected because we've added electron donating and electron withdrawing groups. Um, but one interesting thing about these, um, are, yeah, these molecules is that they are extremely fluorescent. So this is one of the dilutions I was making for, um, for this UV viz uh, data. So this is about, I think it was 300 micromolar. I just put it under black light and it's extremely bright. Um, because as I said, it's like barely soluble to even go into you know, an NMR solvent um, to be, you know, for a proton NMR. And this is even more dilute than that. And it, you know, it's this bright. So it's quite nice. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, this was also right maybe two months before I defended, um, right when I got my postdoc offer. So it, it was kind of like, you know, I have a, a position after this, I can't really work on it anymore. We couldn't get any of our collaborators to agree to work on it. They just weren't interested. Um, so the idea was somebody else was just going to take this and kind of work on it and, and, and finish up. So currently, I don't know where uh, the status is, but you know, it was at least you know gratifying to to get somewhere near the end. Um, so just to highlight um, the twelve circulating derivatives um, in, in their synthesis, the thermal activation of twelve amine uh, and deals all the reactions was unsuccessful as well as electronic modifications. Um, the optimized barton kellogg olefination conditions um, from other projects in the group, uh, however, may provide access to these highly, sec highly substituted 12 circulating derivatives. And um, thiene annulation conditions for generating BTBT have been unreliable uh, to generate fully electron deficient um, derivatives. Um, I successfully synthesized push-pull der push derivatives um, but further characterization is needed to determine utility of these 
in uh, electronics devices. Uh, so with that, I'm going to completely switch gears um, and bamboozle everyone uh, with part four of this talk, which is the thermal atomic layer deposition of metals uh, for liner and barrier applications. And so this is work in my postdoc, and a lot of it is, um, you know, uh, still under an embargo because it hasn't been published yet, um, which we're working on that currently. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to give kind of a general overview of, of what we're working on. Um, so uh, smaller device dimensions uh, requires development of new high performance materials that can be used as ultra thin barriers and liners. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of, you know, the different nodes, you know, 10 nanometer, five nanometer, three nanometer. So one issue with this is when you scale down to those dimensions, um, uh, typical say metals and liners that are used such as the uh, tungsten and titanium based contact plugs uh, can no longer be scaled down. Um, so this, this barrier material um, does a couple things. It, it um, provides a uh, sort of a contact for the tungsten uh, for underlying layers, but it also chemically protects underlying layers from the uh, tungsten hexafluoride CVD precursor. Um, so if you basically we're at the point where we can no longer scale this, um, the thickness of this uh, barrier material down without degradation um, of other aspects of the, of the contact plug. And additionally, tungsten um, at these dimensions, the, resist the resistance of tungsten uh, increases dramatically. So there's been a drive to sort of replace this whole um, uh, contact plug with some other material. And so recently in the literature, there's been some report of co-sputtering um, of metal, metals or metal alloy layers that can replace you know, both uh, current copper diffusion barriers as well as this entire contact plug. Um, architecture or, or um, you know, I guess materials. Um, however, in high aspect ratio features, co sputtering uh, is problematic. Um, and therefore, our project seeks to grow metals and metal alloys using thermal atomic layer deposition. And so, uh, we use thermal ALD for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, ALD allows sub nanometer scale thickness control um, as well as highly conformal film growth. Uh, and this is because this ALD mechanism is uh, it's sequential and therefore it's inherently cell eliminating. Um, so in this is general scheme here, I show the reaction between um, trimethyl aluminum and water. Um, so in an ALD process, the first step is to introduce a, uh, a precursor to um, uh, whatever desired substrate you're depositing on. In this case, it's silicon. Um, and, and in this step, the uh, ALD precursors will react with every available surface reactive site, thus saturating um, the surface. Uh, and the second step of this uh, is a purge step. We're using inert gas to purge out excess um, precursor, as well as reaction byproducts. Uh, the third step is introduction, introduction of a second uh, a reactant or a second precursor. Uh, and in this case, once again, it reacts with every available um, surface reactive site in a saturated manner. Uh, and then the fourth step, is a second purge step to remove you know, precursor and reaction byproducts. You can repeat this uh, for any, any number of uh, cycles to get the desired film thickness. Um, and we use thermal ALD uh, again because it, it can result in uh, conformal films, while uh, physical vapor deposition and chemical vapor deposition methods uh, can result in voids or non conformal film growth in this very exaggerated example. And here's just a uh, this is a TM image of an ALD film showing nice conformal growth. Um, and we also don't use plasmas. Uh, there is plasma enhanced ALD, um, but in very high aspect ratio features, um, the reactive plasma species can recombine on the surface and, and give non conformal film growth. Um, and so, just because I don't know how many people have even seen an ALD reactor, this is the one we use. It's a PicoSun R75. Um, and Really, all of the precursors and, and pulsing mechanisms are down here in this lower cabinet. Um, it looks like it's basically some very intricate tubing and, and, uh, and pulsing valves. Um, it's not very exciting once you get used to it, but I just thought I'd, I'd show this um, for people who aren't, aren't familiar. It's a relatively small piece of equipment. Um, so our envisioned chemistry for this was to develop a um, metal two precursor and react it with a nitrogen containing Lewis base. Uh, by thermal ALD to deposit a metal nitride intermediate film. 
And then this film would decompose uh, during the ALD process, uh, losing nitrogen to give a metal film. And so even though this is this has a decomp decomposition um, aspect to it, it's, it's still a thermal ALD process because we are depositing the initial nitride film by thermal ALD. Um, and uh, so based on some of the, the literature uh, that we were following for you know, some of these processes, uh, we had a, a general idea of what temperature range these metal nitrides uh, decompose at. Um, so basically what we had to do was balance um, our uh, precursor thermal stability with the uh, decomposition temperature of this uh, nitride film. And so this required uh, development of a volatile, highly thermally stable uh, metal precursor. Um, and so it, it's gonna get a bit more weird here because I can't go into any uh, details about what we're doing. Um, but an ALD process uh, typically has a temperature window in which the growth rate is independent of the temperature. Uh, so we do this by you know, plotting growth rate versus temperature. Um, and you can see here, we have a, you know, uh, an ALD window that's maybe from 180 to about, or uh, 280 to about 290 degrees C, uh, where the growth rate is relatively uh, stable over this temperature window. Um, this is relatively narrow for an ALD process, um, but sometimes uh, an ALD process will just have a, an ALD point as opposed to a window. Um, and the main point of having, or I guess benefit of having a wide, wide ALD window is when you transfer this you know, uh, process to say an actual um, use in, um, I guess the, the semiconductor industry, uh, a wide window gives them just a wide temperature range that they can operate at. Uh, in, in sort of the larger, you know, design of a stack. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier during the mechanism talk, uh, or mechanism portion, uh, ALD process, an ALD process is also uh, saturated. And so what we do for these is we take each precursor and we plot the pulse length, um, and, or we alter the pulse length individually. So in this case, we, you know, ran several depositions of, uh, altering the metal precursor pulse length while keeping the co-reactant um, pulse length constant. And what you'll see for an ALD process is at some point introduction of additional precursor won't re result in uh, an increase in growth rate. And when this happens, uh, we say that the uh, process is saturated. So this is just you know kind of a, a procedure just to show that you do indeed have an ALD um, process happening. And uh, uh, I analyzed the films using uh, initially using uh, grazing incidence XRD, and uh, the diffraction pattern uh, I received was consistent with uh, deposition of our desired metal or our metal al metal alloyed with the copper substrate. And so I just have an image here. It was nice to see uh, a visible metallic uh, looking film on top of a copper substrate post deposition. Um, however, this analysis was um, uh, additional analysis was required to do, to you know definitively determine the film composition. Um, so I grew a few additional films, uh, treated one of them with a post deposition anneal at 400 degrees C, and submitted them for uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy analysis. And so here I'm just showing uh, uh, two different XPS depth profiles. Um, so on the left is uh, the all of the films grown at various temperatures without annealing had very similar um, um, depth profiles. And on the right, this is the film that was uh, annealed at 400 degrees C. So the non-annealed films all had about, you know, two to 3% carbon and oxygen and 8% nitrogen after sputtering. And so you can see that here, uh, the initial contaminants are sputtered away. And then throughout the rest of the film, it's pretty consistent, 8% nitrogen, and, you know, two to 3% carbon and oxygen. Um, however, the annealed film had you know, about 3% oxygen, but 0% carbon and nitrogen after sputtering. So you can see after sputtering off the initial contaminants, um, the oxygen level also drops, um, but carbon and nitrogen uh, are 0% you know, throughout the rest of the film. And we attribute this oxygen content to the fact that we, you know, there were several months between you know, running the deposition, sending them out, and actually having them analyzed. Um, so we attribute this to their long time, uh, these, the long uh, air exposure time of these films uh, between deposition and analysis. 
Um, so now that we have an XPS on site, our next step is to just, you know, do one quick deposition and quickly run downstairs and, and get XPS on it to see if, you know, we can minimize the amount of oxygen in the film that way. Um, for an ALV process, typically uh, the relationship between film thickness and number of cycles is linear. Um, so we, we always do this analysis on our, on our processes. Um, and in my case, you can see here in this, uh, the black data set, uh, I was not getting a linear relationship between film thickness and number of cycles. Uh, the growth rate drops off quite dramatically with longer run times. Um, but I analyzed some of these films by X-ray fluorescence, um, which is, you know, in basic terms, just a, a measurement of the concentration of the desired metal. And I did see a linear increase in, in this case. So what we're actually seeing during this process is that uh, the film is densifying with longer run times. Um, we think it's sort of a self annealing process in a way um, as, it loses, as part of it losing uh, nitrogen um, and decomposing to the metal. Um, and with that, just to give a quick summary and conclusion, I developed a new thermal ALD process uh, using a, a metal two precursor with a nitrogen containing Lewis base. Uh, this deposits a metal nitride film that decomposes to metal during the ALD process. Uh, and films grown at various temperatures had low uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen impurities with the post deposition anneal, uh, giving a high quality film with no carbon or nitrogen. Uh, so our next steps are to complete some of our final ALD experiments uh, and obviously uh, finally submit a paper for publication. And then, sort of as I mentioned at the beginning of, of this portion, uh, the main goal is to uh, develop an alloy process for the uh, barrier film. So we're tri trialing our second metal uh, ALD depositions and eventually going to incorporate that into an alloying uh, process. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, awesome. Thank you for a fantastic talk. That was very interesting. Um, and we do have some questions for you. Um, so I'll just run down through those. Uh, the first one was uh, Alchemy Schmalchemy wanted to know uh, if, you, if you've if you done any electrochemistry. This was on Compound 29. Um, so it's a little ways back. Um, but he, he wanted to ask about that. Um. Yeah. Uh, actually, we never did. This was a. Oh, it's been so long since I've, I've read this paper. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was a previously published um, procedure to make this. So I don't actually remember if they did any um, any additional study beyond just characterization and like a crystal structure. Um, okay. If you'd like to take a look, these are the the references for this. Um, uh, for the procedures if you want to just take a quick screenshot or something yeah um, absolutely yeah and this this will be uploaded as well and okay um yeah yeah but, oh man it's been uh, yeah no that's that's nice. fair <laughs> yeah with, with all with 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 all that going on in the molecules it's it the electrochemistry i'm sure would be very interesting yeah um typically what we'll do with um some of these also these PAHs is just do like uh you know sodium or lithium or potassium reductions on them uh, just to see if they, yeah, to get at least some idea of their, their electric chemistry. I got you. Okay. Uh, let's see. So the next question. Um, okay. How does, how does the thiene annihilation work or sorry, the thiene annihilation reaction work? So there's no, um, you know, well-defined uh, mechanism, but what I think happens is it's just a two-step um, nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Um, I wish I had the slide of my uh, proposed mechanism for these, um, but hold on, let me find. Uh, uh, I guess here's a good example. So then essentially the first step is just a nucleophilic aromatic substitution, um, you know, attack of the sulfide mm -hmm. on this um, uh, arrow bromide bond, um, lose the bromine, uh, that S minus here then attacks the alkene um, forming the first thiophene and leave, leaving the anion there. That anion then attacks uh, the iodine. Um, you know, to where do I have sort of the partially completed ones? So in that case, you would have you know an iodine here, mm -hmm. um, and then it undergoes a second 
nucleophilic aromatic substitution um, to have the sulfide in this position, uh, which then does another one here to close the final thiophene. At least that's what I think happens. Okay. Uh, um, there's there's no real like evidence of any of this. No one's really done a, a full study of that. Okay. Um, that's, that's still that that's, that seems like a reasonable a reasonable uh, uh, yeah best guess anyway. Yeah, and so what we think happens, the reason it sort of stalls at this position mm -hmm. is that once you have this anion here, uh, the overall you know the molecule is you know, extremely electron deficient. Uh, we were thinking that like, maybe this just uh, isn't reactive enough to sort of attack the iodine and form that arrow iodide bond. Um, but, okay. you know, that was just kind of what we were kind of throwing around at the time. We're not really sure what happens, especially because, you know, we get back the, you know, after workup, we get back the, you know, just the protonated form. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Uh, you also want to know, I know you, you did some, you, you talked about some microwave heating early on. Did you do any microwave heating for uh, some of these tougher reactions that you showed? Yeah, so I, I, I ran it um, under these conditions shown here because mm -hmm. uh, I had already been running these in acetonitrile and acetyl 2. Okay. Um, I ran one of these with microwave heating and it was just, it was a disaster. <laughs> when <laughs> okay. I got out, it was just like basically just like black charred material that I couldn't, ah. uh, you know, really separate and it just smelled awful. I'm like sure it, it did, crazy yeah, with the sulfur in there. Sulfur yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even out of my hood, like it escaped my hood and i was just like and everything that it touched it was just terrible <laughs> oh oh man so, so any any sulfur containing especially when it's something small like that it is so bad yeah um okay so just now that this is this is a question for me because i'm this this field is completely outside of anything that i've ever done um, so with conventional heating versus microwave heating what's is there an advantage to doing one over the other um, it's, it can essentially what it can do is, uh, you know, make a reaction, reaction time much shorter. Um, cause okay. what happens, I think what happens in the actual sort of reaction vessel is you get small areas of very intense heat for very short amounts of time. Okay. Um, so you can basically just accelerate your reaction time, um, you know, compared to sort of just, uh, conventional like, thermal heating. Okay. Okay. So, so it's, it's a, it's a faster way to, to try and get where you're going. Yeah. Essentially. Okay. That's interesting. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, other question we've got. So somebody asking, uh, what metals, what metals will commonly form nitrides from amines and what amines can you use in the ALD, uh, reaction? Um, typically we use, um, primary amines. Um, okay. but there's, you know, you can technically use anything that's volatile and thermally stable enough to be delivered. Mm -hmm. um, but generally when we're say, cause our group, you know, does tons of these, you know, types of, of um, ALD processes. Uh, it's, it's usually say like a hydrazine derivative or a primary mm -hmm. amine um, just cause those are, you know, very reactive and they're very volatile. So, and, and rel relatively easy to handle. So those are what we usually stick to. Okay. Um, and there are many uh, metals that form nitrides. Uh, I don't really want to go into it. Yeah, that, um, that's fair. I know, <laughs> I know you're trying to protect some of it right now. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So is there, in this, maybe, uh, can you go back to the, the diagram that you had of the, the three contact points? You, you were oh, kind yeah. of showing like what the what the current ALD state of, not not state of the art but the the cont uh it was it was yeah. the di the diagram of the ALD um this one um, yes thank you yeah um, okay so you have the these contact plugs <laughs> and it looks like it's, okay so you have a tungsten titanium titanium nitride contact mm -hmm. is that something I mean I, again I know you can't necessarily uh. Maybe, maybe go into full details, but with the stuff that you're talking about, like with the alloys and that kind of thing, are you looking to ultimately form something along those lines? Um, essentially, it's to replace this with a, you know, totally different, um, totally different materials. Okay. So the, the alloy layer that, that we're targeting can be thinner than these um, titanium and tinitride base layers. Mm -hmm. um, and also it replaces uh, the tungsten. So okay. you can... So we're also, we wouldn't be running into that um, 
high uh, resistance that tungsten faces at those uh, dimensions. Um, okay. And additionally, with with what we're working on, the plan is to because you know we do synthesis of new precursors and also ALD. So the plan is to expand anything we learn from the the metals we're depositing to you know a, other transition metals that are difficult to um, say reduce. Uh, to metals during an ALD process. Okay. So we're kind of looking at, we're looking at it like this is the main target of our, say our, the grant we're on, mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to expand it uh, further in, in later years. Okay. That's interesting. So I've done a little bit of ALD work, but it was mostly um, just, just like very basic, you know, depositing like a metal layer, that kind of thing. So not, nothing, nothing overly complex. Mm -hmm. Um, this is kind of interesting because you know I, I, I've read plenty of papers about you know the the you know depositing alloys, depositing, depositing nitrides and and carbides and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was nice to get a good explanation of of sort of what the what the chemistry behind it is. Yeah. When you're when you're trying to sort of come up with something new. Mm -hmm. um, so with so the the post annealing. That you do on these, on there, or that you've been doing on the, on this ALD work, mm -hmm. um, is it done? What what's your atmosphere there? Is it just an inert uh, uh, annealing yeah. to drive off the nitrogen, or? Yeah. So even though, so you can, I'll go, oops, I'll go back to the picture of the the chamber. So we have a load lock on this ALD chamber. Yeah. Um, but what I was doing was basically running the deposition in uh, in the software. You can set an end temperature. Mm -hmm. So I just set the end temperature to 400. So it ramped up to 400 at the end of the deposition, still under nitrogen. Ah, uh, okay. And then I cooled it to room temp and removed it. Um, so it never was exposed to, to air or anything else. Okay, that's, that's really handy. Mm -hmm. um, what's, the, what's the time frame to do, uh, for like, like let's say the, the 2000 cycles that you wanna run for the ALD, how long does that normally take? Um, for this process, it's quite long. It's, okay. um, I think it's about 12 hours. Wow. Okay. Um, so what I found during this was uh, I needed a very long purge time, about mm -hmm. 10 seconds. That's very, I guess that's not that long, but for some of the other, for compared, to some of the, yeah, for, compared to some of the other ones we do, that's quite long. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, what, and the growth rate for this is also pretty low. If I go back to the uh, ALD window, it's mm -hmm. about 0.3 angstroms per cycle. Um, yeah. So like when we're tar trying to get like thicker films, which we will need for some of the collaborative work we're working on, um, you know, the runs can get quite long in this case. Um, so it's unfortunate. It's not what uh, say industry likes to hear. <laughs> sure, sure. Although I mean, I'm sure it's one of those things where once you once you lay the groundwork, somebody can, you know, whether yeah. whether it's in, within your group or or you know, an industry partner can probably come in and say, oh, okay. What if we do this, this, yeah. and this? They probably have like a crazy like turbo pump or something that can just like they don't have to purge oh, sure, for very yeah. long. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, they they always have the very nice stuff to work with. Yeah. Um, now if, if this one, this is another if you can answer it question. Um, is there anything special about the copper and ruthenium substrates, or is that um, just just something that's handy to grow off of the, grow the ALD on? Um, well, that was just what this process was selected for. Okay. Um, anything that's selective can be beneficial just from a, you know, device architecture point of view. Like you might need something to grow a metal on, but you only want it on copper versus whatever else is on, mm -hmm. say a chip, um, on, or like on the stack. Okay. So it, it's just, it could be useful. It's not always useful. Um, but a, a big part of, um, I think like NAND memory. Um, deposition a lot of that is they're really intent on uh, selective depositions now maybe okay. not necessarily on metals but it, you know it can be but they, but they want to be able to like lay down a, a a network of you know some sub layer and then be able to, to deposit straight onto only that sub layer yeah okay that's interesting mm -hmm. i've not seen all, all the ALD I ever did was basically just throw a substrate in there and say, please deposit all over the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. trying to do a, doing selective ALD was not even something I worried about. Yeah, I think that's like a, a relatively recent, um, you know, need for that. Uh, 
That makes sense. I guess, yeah, especially as you talked about the, the you know, people trying out new materials and that kind of thing. Because mm-hmm. even, um, even like not having something that's very selective, you might have like something that you can etch away or whatever. It kind of gives you the same result. Which is sure. Useful. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So I, I have another, this is another question uh, going back to the, um, the, the polycyclic aromatics. Mm-hmm. Now, I, probably if I was a chemist, I would I would already know the answer to this. Um, how do you? I mean, I, I know some of it is just prior knowledge, basically. But how do you work out the steps that you expect to take? Because it seems like, because uh, at least in some of the diagrams you showed, you you were more. It seemed like you were more or less starting at the product and walking backwards and saying, okay. To get this product, I need to do this. To get this, you know, to get this intermediate, I need to do this. Yeah, it's Is actually, that- yeah, it's really common in um, organic chemistry. It's mm-hmm. uh, b- you basically do retrosynthetic analysis. Okay. So you, s- you start at your target, and that's literally what you do is you work backwards. So say, you know, I already had experience with how to get from the alkyne to, you know, the BTBT product. So I was like, the first step is thiene angulation. Or the, okay. the, the last step is thine emulation. And then, you know, I'd already had experience with the, you know, some of the shear coupling, so it's pretty easy to go backwards from there. Okay. So it's, it's kind of like a you use your prior knowledge or, you know, what functionalization you want to add mm-hmm. and just, you know, you know, find the reaction or the reactivity to get you there. Um, okay. And in this case, like even this is like fairly general. Like my initial idea was like, sure, we just treat this with an amine, but I had to, you know, use thionyl chloride first and, and do it that okay. way. So it, it's usually just used as a tool to get a plan and it usually never works. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, I've known some, I knew some organic chemists when I was in grad school and, and doing a postdoc and, it, oh man, the, you, you guys have a lot of patience. I, <laughs> I don't think I could have done that just because, because they would talk about doing, you know, 12 and 14 plus you know or more step uh syntheses they'd be like yeah i got to step number 16 and and you know this thing didn't work and i got no yield yeah that was a year (laughs) like oh my god (laughs) yeah it's it's rough like like, these reaction schemes aren't even that long compared to like a natural product sure (laughs) i can't even imagine Oh yeah, oh god, yeah. They, oh man, <laughs> I, I, like I said, I, I can't do I can't do synthesis synthesis like this, and I can't do anything with biological systems that require you know like cell lines and that kind of thing. Because if yeah. I had a freezer fail, I think I might just go find something else to do. Yeah, uh, that is that's something. Um. All right, so I, I think I'm I'm about out of questions. I'll see if, if anybody in chat has another question. Hit exclamation point Q uh, space and, and write your question. It'll be added. Um, and I'll give them a, a little bit of time uh, to, to get any last questions in. Uh, but I will say this is, this is fascinating stuff. Like I said, you know, it's well outside of, of any of my background, but you did a great job explaining uh, the, the whole point of it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you have, oh, do you have any DFT? of the uh, push-pull BTBTs? Um, someone, right as I was leaving, um, they did some... Uh, all right, I'm going to preface this by saying I know almost nothing about DFT. Okay, <laughs> but same, they did some, same, um, so we're good. <laughs> they did some uh, TDDFT calculations. Um, you know, it, it was... I wish I remembered, actually, what the results of it were. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Basically, they were modeling, um, you know, we had a few ideas for different sort of, I guess, push, you know, uh, functional groups here. And they did some, you know, energy level modeling. Okay. And they, uh, another part of it was just comparing it to the CABTBT. And, mm-hmm. you know, it basically matched what we saw here in the, the, the UVVIS. Okay. So, uh, so it, it, is, it did predict the UVVIS that you actually, that you experiment, experimentally measured? Yeah, which was, you know, it was nice, but that is nice, kind of yeah. like, I, like I said, like near the end of this, so I, I, I got to this point a few months, maybe before my postdoc, mm-hmm. and uh, we had some collaborators that, you know, I had made, basically made compounds for them, and then they were like, okay, this is what we want, 
make it for us because we don't want to spend two thousand dollars on it sure um you know whatever um but when we came to them with this like hey this is a thing that hasn't been published before that thing you're working on has been published 120 odd times right do you want to do something with this and they just like didn't (laughs) they just didn't want to do it i was like oh that's a weird that's weird (laughs) what what kind of stuff were you were you hoping to do with it so basically we just asked them if they could make us some devices and we could test the mobility um because they had a they had a sort of their own deposition method they developed in their lab Mm -hmm. um that was very good for say analyzing a crystal structures but also just for depositing thin films of organic materials got it um so we were like hey we you know you have everything set up for us to do this analysis yeah (laughs) um can can we just do it and then you know they could deposit it we could evaporate some you know um, electrodes on and just test it but you know we two different groups we went to and i even emailed you know external groups to our university yeah two other groups and nobody really wanted to work with us at all it, which was strange because i'm like i already have it like it's here in a bio like yeah you know, i could just send it to you but because we couldn't you know we couldn't really publish this synthesis on its own you know mm-hmm. we don't have full characterization because it's so insoluble yeah. we don't have a cryo probe on our campus so we couldn't do you know c13 nmr under cryo conditions uh, or with like cryo cooled uh, electronics um, okay. so like we basically couldn't if we couldn't just publish this we needed more of it we just couldn't find a someone that wanted to help us out that is unfortunate yeah Man. Um, but then i was getting really frustrated with that and got uh offered the postdoc and i was like okay i don't care anymore <laughs> yeah yeah getting getting the postdoc offer definitely eases the pain on that one a little bit yeah uh okay so just as a heads up and i think I think this is Kyle, so he's actually in, in our Discord. Um, he says he has a colleague that goes to, I don't, I don't know what CNM is, um, but he has his colleague does transient absorption would be interested in the compound, so maybe you guys should talk oh. a little bit uh, after okay. this. Okay. Yeah, I, I still know someone in the in the group uh, back at UVM. I could have him send it off. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, so that's, there, there we go. Maybe we, yeah. oh, the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne. Okay. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, there you go. We'll nice. uh, make sure you guys get connected. <laughs> maybe maybe you'll actually get a paper out of it. Here we go. Yeah, like uh, four <laughs> years later. <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah, sounds uh, good. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Are there, are there any other questions from uh, chat? Oh, if we got, I know we had we had a couple of new people tonight, which is awesome. Always That's like to good. see that. Nice. Um. So I guess uh. Yeah, I think that's looks like that might be it. I'll, I'll wait a little bit longer. We'll, we can kind of start wrapping up. Um, so again, yeah. like I said, thank you for a fantastic talk, both yeah. both the synthesis uh, portions and the uh, the ALD. Uh, they were both exceedingly interesting. Um, like thank I said, you. especially for me, this this is outside of my my typical area, so I'm really learning a lot from it. Um. But uh, yeah, so I, I guess I guess we'll go ahead and finish. I think that's all the questions we got from chat. Um, so I'll say, uh, you know, thank you to everybody for coming out. Uh, thank you again, Jonathan, for the talk. Um, if you are in fact new here and would be interested in giving a talk, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, you can PM me on here. You can uh, send me an email at meekins at se.edu. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, at Meekins Lab, M-E-E-K-I-N-S, L-A-B, all together. Um, we have a YouTube channel, and we also have a Discord. Um, this this presentation and all of the Q&A will be uploaded to YouTube uh, probably tonight. Uh, it normally takes a little bit of time to process, um, so certainly it'll be ready by tomorrow. Um, and Jonathan, of course, you are welcome to, you know, use that as you see fit. Um, that That's really, it's for the speakers to sort of have something to show for uh, what they did. Um, but yeah, so, you know, uh, thank you for everybody for coming out. Uh, and Jonathan, thank you for a fantastic talk. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for listening and asking questions. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and uh, I think with that, we will sign off here and um, I w- hope to see everybody here next week. Um, we Right now that's an open slot, but uh, 
if you have some, you know, if anybody wants to, to claim it, please feel free. And, uh, or if you have a colleague or somebody that would like to claim it, please feel free to do that. And, um, yeah, I think that's going to be it. So thanks everybody for coming out and have a good night. Good night.